this high altitude physiology it is a form of which type of hypoxia it is a form of hypoxic hypoxia here the oxygen or the atmospheric levels of oxygen itself is low so it is a form of hypoxic hypoxia what happens as and when we ascend the barometric pressure keeps on dropping at sea levels we have the barometric pressure of 760 but when we climb the mountains like 5500 meters above it drops to half of it the himalayas is at around 8800 meters so think of it the oxygen levels will be very very low there it is a severe form of hypoxic hypoxia here what happens is the percentage of gases remains the same all the percentage of gases remains same for example 21 percentage of oxygen there also 21 percentage is oxygen but the overall quantity itself is reduced and one more dangerous thing is the water vapor pressure remains the same even for this 760 mm of Hg, it is 47 only again for 300 also if it is 47 only so when we subtract it from 760 at some decrease decreases there but from 300 it is taking a major chunk for water vapor pressure so the availability of oxygen is going to drop a lot so whenever we go into a high altitude two things happen one is called as the acclimatization another form is called as the adaptation the first form is called acclimatization acclimatization can happen in any of us we are not mountain dwellers suppose if you are a mountain dwellers you might have adaptations you are going for a high altitude from the lowlander you are a lowlander you are going for a high altitude so this acclimatization usually happens but if the people are staying there for a very long period the generations are there then it can go for an adaptation so acclimatation is temporary change whereas adaptation is a permanent change here happens in a short time it happens over generations here the genetic makeup is usually not affected here the changes are inherited genetically that's why mountainers have an added advantage in their genes wherein their body stature rbc count and everything helps them to live in high altitudes so let's try to understand this acclimatization first so what happens in acclimatization what are the changes happening in acclimatization so first thing is the changes just remember the changes happen at all the levels starting from the respiratory system starting from the nose it happens at all the levels like intake of air it happens at all the levels first thing is it there is hyperventilation there is hyperventilation as and when we ascend this is the first sign that happens hyperventilation why hyperventilation should happen hypoxia stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors and there will be hyperventilation but because of this hyperventilation what will happen there will be a co2 washout causing a respiratory alkalosis someone has to help this to overcome this respiratory alkalosis who comes and helps it is nothing but our kidneys which will try to conserve the h plus and induce a metabolic acidosis to overcome this respiratory alkalosis second thing first level it has happened second thing is the diffusion point the alveoli which is diffusing the oxygen to the blood the diffusion capacity of the lung itself will increase both by increase in the lung volume and increase in the diameter of the pulmonary capillaries both are happening so that will help the increase in diffusion capacity third thing is which is happening at the circulatory level now from diffusion we have come to the circulatory level here what will happen is there will be an increase in rbc count which is also called as polycythemia polycythemia this polycythemia is a natural phenomena in case of highlanders what happens this hypoxia whenever there is an hypoxia the kidneys will produce a substance called as hypoxia inducible factor because of this hypoxia there is an induction of a factor which is hypoxia inducible factor and this hypoxia inducible factor will stimulate the erythropoietin and erythropoietin all of us know it is going to stimulate the production of rbc's it is increasing the colony forming unit erythroblast it directly stimulates the primitive cells itself so that more and more rbc's can be produced finally coming to the tissue even at the tissue level so many things happen the tissue level there is increased angiogenesis for the same tissue now many vessels are giving branches it is also because of the hypoxia inducible factor that's why hypoxia inducible factor is also called as the master switch it is also called as the master switch it produces vegf what is this vegf which is vascular endothelial growth factors so this growth factors will help us to produce more and more branches and vessels and finally ultimately they are going to help angiogenesis so they are helping in angiogenesis 
then coming to the final one the cellular modification are inside the cell intracellularly there is an increase in cell mitochondria and increase in cytochrome oxidase so starting from the periphery till the last level everything can get get acclimatized to the high altitude then if the person is not able to adapt to the high altitude he will develop some form of sickness so that form of sickness is called acute mountain sickness it is very common with people who do a rapid ascent for example they suddenly want to go to leh ladakh in one day that should not be done there should be a slow ascent you should stay in some place for some other time get yourself acclimatized then climb up much much higher you should not rapidly ascend to very high altitudes this develops within 8 to 24 hours now we are talking about acute mountain sickness so there are three forms of acute mountain sickness one is the acute mountain sickness itself then hasse and hape what is this hasse it is high altitude ce is for cerebral edema then what is this hape this hape is nothing but high altitude pulmonary edema that is there is pulmonary edema so that is high altitude pulmonary edema so what is the most important symptom to call it as an acute mountain sickness it is nothing but the headache so headache is a mandatory symptom all of them will develop with headache in acute mountain sickness then irritability breathlessness nausea and vomiting all these things will happen then what is hase hase will include all the features of this common ams plus there will be cerebral edema as we as the name suggests it is high high altitude cerebral edema so the person will be having ataxia and disorientation if he is having ataxia and disorientation then it is a hase then what happens here is there is huge cerebral or vas cerebral vasodilatation because of hypoxia the brain is one area which doesn't want to compromise its blood supply it will vasodilate a lot so whenever it is vasodilating a lot what will happen there is capillary leakage this capillary leakage is causing the corpus callosal edema or any region edema the most common region involved is corpus callosal edema now coming to hape it is the ams like all symptoms of first product will be here then followed by a pulmonary edema so but in case of pulmonary edema there is not vasodilatation because hypoxia everywhere in the body hypoxia in everywhere in the systemic circulation will cause vasodilatation but pulmonary system will not cause vasodilatation it will also always cause vaso constriction so that's why it is called as hypoxia induced pulmonary vaso constriction hypoxic pulmonary vaso constriction this hypoxic pulmonary vaso constriction constrict the vessels of the uh, vessels of the lung so what will happen from this area it will be diverted to the from this vessels it will be trying to divert to, to the other vessels so there will be severe stress or severe force which is needed for the heart to pump so this stress will cause the failure of the endothelium leading on to the stress failure which is finally leading on to the edema in the lungs so this is high altitude pulmonary edema and because of pulmonary hypertension what is going to happen there will be a right heart failure also in a long run which will see in the chronic mountain sickness what happens in chronic mountain sickness it usually develops after some years here the rbc count hematocrit count all of them are going to increase so whenever they increase we think it is good but too much increase is not so good so here the blood viscosity also will increase leading on to the decrease tissue blood flow and this pulmonary artery hypertension will cause the right heart failure also on your longer run so these are the features of chronic mountain sickness coming to the management the first and foremost and simplest management is descent to a lower altitude and precautionarily acetazolamide can be taken it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor so whenever this is inhibited it will conserve the h plus so h plus ions whenever it is conserved it will create acidosis so it will give impulses to the respiratory stimulus respiratory stimulus will be there respiration is increased then if there is edema whether cerebral or pulmonary the treatment is glucocorticoids and finally oxygen therapy can be given and one drug has been nicely proven to be essential for pulmonary artery hypertension which is nifedipine so all this treatment is also important